the cord part two to the cloud. Um, it was about the the parking tickets, and it, it was I think about that being something withheld, but really it seemed like another example of punishment to me. So I was just kind of confused about that as an example. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've I've thought about that one many times. I've lectured about twenty times using that slide, and I think I'm confused on that one. So you're not alone. I'll leave it at that. I think it's wrong. I think that example is wrong. Because I've looked at it, I've, I've said to myself, is that right? That sounds like punishment, not re not negative reinforcement. And um, so I've learned to just kind of skim over that slide. <laughs> and I'll just, yeah. So the terms that we had a short, those of you watching later, we had breakout groups and we talked what terms came up in the videos that were watched or my video lecture. And the terms that came out in the video lecture were classical conditioning, operant conditioning, condition responses, uh, condition stimuli, neutral stimuli, generalization of the um, conditioning episodes, extinction of the learned behaviors, counter conditioning to get new behaviors to, to, to be evoked by the organism, spontaneous recovery, and it maybe it, it lapsed, the behavior lapsed, and you got the subject to re emit that behavior that you wanted after a period of time by re exposing that, um, the subject to the condition stimulus. Um, punishment, satisfying, unsatisfying, um, and schedules of reinforcement, fixed and variable, fixed interval, variable interval, fixed ratio, variable ratio. And then classroom management comes out of this redirection of students, praising students. The other group, Christian's group, talked more about what happens in schools, I guess. My group talked about traditional behavioral theory. So we had different terms that came up in, in, in both of those. Um, and so we're going to move to um, videos now that will explain it. I'm going to have these videos. I think they'll show up. Uh, you'll have to correct me. I think if I click the share screen and I hit the optimize sound and optimize video, and then I share my screen. And um, of course, no, I better not do it. So let me try that again. Let me share my screen. Okay. I had to pick something first. There we go. This is tricky sometimes. Let me try and hide my video panel. Um, come on. Sometimes it's really hard on a laptop to click the right little button. Oh, no, hide floating. Okay, great. So the first one will be from Harry Potter. And Can you hear that, Christian? I can hear it. So the, the, what it is, reinforcer, increase the frequency of the particular behavior that you want to happen, primary, second. So the, the, the term will come up before the episode for each one of these, okay? So here we'll see primary reinforcers or secondary reinforcers or competition. Food, water, blah, 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 is primary. Secondary reinforcers, grades, praise, trophies, points. Well, we're going to see secondary reinforcers. Welcome to Hogwarts. Now, in a few moments, you will pass through these doors and join your classmates. But before you can take your seats, you must be sorted into your houses. They are Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. Now, while you're here, your house will be like your family. Your triumphs will earn you points. Any rule breaking and you will lose points. At the end of the year, the house with the most points is awarded the house cup. All behavioral theory. Now we get to positive versus negative reinforcement. As for you two gentlemen, well, I just hope you realize how fortunate you are. Not many first-year students could take on a fully grown mountain troll and live to tell the tale. Five points will be awarded to each of you. For sheer dumb luck. 
Now this would be extrinsic reinforcement, reinforcer that comes from outside the environment rather than from within the learner. And now we move to intrinsic reinforcement, reinforcer provided by the learner or inherent in the task performed. That sure sounded like extrinsic, not intrinsic to me, winning points. Anyhow, we moved on to negative reinforcement um, uh, being about the increase of a behavior through the removal of a stimulus. I went looking for the troll. I read about them and thought I could handle it. But I was wrong. Be that as it may, it was an extremely foolish thing to do. I would have expected more rational behavior on your part, and I am very disappointed in you, Miss Granger. Five points will be taken from Gryffindor for your serious lack of judgment. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully you caught some things there in that little clip. Um, any comments before I move on to number two in here? Yeah, I have one. Uh, so we're talking about parking tickets as being a punishment, not negative reinforcement, right? Um, what if we think of it that way? We're removing the stimulus, which is the ability to park wherever you want however you want and we're reinforcing it by doing the the the, 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 the tickets and thus we're encouraging parking of the right spots could that be considered or not hmm. what do you think jennifer what do you think i mean i'd like to see the slide i mean i'd like whoa we're getting a feedback um i'd like to see the slide again but i was thinking of for that particular point on the chart, like withholding the privilege of parking, like taking someone's parking tag away rather than imposing a fine, the fine, I, I don't know. It's a tricky one. I'll have the slide up. I'll put the slide and then we can think about it again. So now we're on to part number two. This is kind of a cute one. Uh, you might have seen this scene before. I've seen it many times. I've showed this many times. Uh, I'm not a fan of this show. I mean, I like the show, but I actually haven't watched a movie in probably two years. I, I, I watch a little bit of TV. Um, uh, IU women's basketball and men's, nah, men's is, is boring, but women's basketball is good. And um, okay. What's this cartoon called again? Oshikuru Demon Samurai. <laughs> and it's not a cartoon, it's anime. Anime. You know, I knew a girl in high school named Anime. Anna Mae Fletcher. <laughs> she was born with one nostril. Then she had this bad nose job and basically wound up with three. <laughs> You're here a lot now. Oh, am I talking too much? I'm sorry. Zip. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chocolate? Yes, please. Let me take this in the hall. <laughs> You'll never guess who they got to replace you with. <laughs> okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> No, I don't want to... Sheldon, you can't train my girlfriend like a lab rat. Actually, it turns out I can. Well, you shouldn't. There's just no pleasing you, is there, Leonard? You weren't happy with my previous approach to dealing with her, so I decided to employ operant conditioning techniques, building on the works of Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. Yet by this time next week, I believe I can have her jumping out of a pool, balancing a beach ball on her nose. No. This has to stop now. I'm not suggesting we really make her jump out of a pool. I thought the bazinga was implied. I'm just tweaking her personality. You're sanding off the rough edges, if you will. No, you're not sanding Penny. Are you saying that I am forbidden from applying a harmless, scientifically valid protocol that will make our lives better? Yes, you're forbidden. Bad, Leonard. <laughs> Okay, that was number two in the list. <laughs> Crazy videos. Um, I keep having to hide my video control panel, so my floating control will go to question or comment on number two, or should I go on to number three? Have you seen that episode before? Yes. Yep. So... All that makes it, positive reinforcement. We see it all the time. If you're doing instructional design, you create feedback loops. If you're doing gaming, you create those positive feedback loops. Positive reinforcement is part and parcel of everything that we do in education, every educational sector, every age group, almost every educational instantiation where there is an instructor and it's not self-directed learning. Even when there is self-directed learning, there's going to be positive reinforcement from the guidebooks or some kind of supplemental materials out there. So in that way, behavioral theory has made its mark. I think that's the biggest mark of behavioral theory is, is the notion of positive reinforcement. And so that's why, why I say, good job, Christian. <laughs> Number three. Operant conditioning, negative reinforcement. Some psychologists perform operant conditioning with punishment. Maybe we can come up with a punishment for straying off topic. Not getting to see who wins at pigeon ping pong comes to mind. <laughs> we could snap a rubber band on our wrists every time we get sidetracked. It's not bad. You know, in medieval times, idle chatter was punished with a device called the scold's bridle. It's a, an iron cage that's locked around the head and pierces the tongue. Only we had one. <laughs> oh, I'll well, check Amazon. <laughs> okay, so we agree. Whenever someone takes us off topic, they get their arm hair yanked off. And I'm really gonna let that happen, or the girl who does my eyebrows will think I've been cheating on her. <laughs> All right, now. One benefit of quantum coupling... Well, no, question. Who decides if someone's gone off topic? I think it'll be pretty clear. If not, we'll take a vote. Oh, and also... D Ow! <laughs> what, what, we didn't vote! But we didn't have to. That was clearly a tangent. Now, come on. Back to work. If we're leaning towards quantum coupling, then we should... Ah, what? <laughs> You said quantum coupling. That made me think of the show Quantum Leap. That's a tangent, and it's your fault. That's ridiculous. Sheldon, I vote that is not a tangent. Yeah, thank you. And now I owe you one. Ow! <laughs> that was your fault. Yay! <laughs> that is a lot of hair. <laughs>
And now I'm going to hear it from Jenny. <laughs> Everyone stop. This was a stupid idea. Negative reinforcement isn't working. I think you mean positive punishment. Negative reinforcement is the removal of a positive stimulus. It's a common mistake. Negative reinforcement is really wrong? <laughs> well, it's used incorrectly all the time. Even Bill Murray makes that mistake in the first scene of Ghostbusters. No way. Not Bill Murray. <laughs> I'm studying the effect of negative reinforcement on ESP ability. Huh. Bill Murray did get it wrong. <laughs> Jump ahead to the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. No! <laughs> <laughs> Leonard's right. We can't just jump ahead. We have to watch the whole movie. Okay, that's number three in the list. Comments. Anyone see that one? I didn't see that one. It's hilarious, actually. I, there are more. Then also off the office, they have several on behavioral theory as well that I've used in the past. Um, well, this helps the concepts come alive anyhow. But if we hearken back to the original the, the studies on behavioral theory, we got to stop and talk about John Watson for a bit. But the problem of John Watson's studies is they were somewhat unethical. Um, we we have we found out later um, in in life after he passed away uh, that the child called little Albert in this video really suffered maybe from autism and other health issues and he probably shouldn't have been a participant in his studies and there were other mm, IRB related rules that he have to uh, mm, apply for today that he probably wouldn't be able to do the studies that he did. A lot of these studies done in the 1920s and 30s um, or previously could not be done in today's climate anyhow. But let's take a look um, at Watson and then we'll get to be a Skinner and a couple others. We'll talk, we'll look at some rats. But not everyone believes that biology is destiny. For many scientists, it's your experiences in life that count. Your upbringing, your education, your environment. Chief among these scientists is psychologist John Watson, who offers a theory that is the mirror opposite of eugenics. This was the heyday of hereditarians and geneticists who said... Including David Starr Jordan and Bloomington, who uh, some streets and buildings are named after, who is a eugenicist and who later became president at Stanford. They've had to change all the names of the streets and buildings named after the guy because um, the theory was uh, very controversial, if you know, to put it mildly, and wrong. Um, and so Watson was counter to that, was the opposite side, in effect, um, how the environment can help uh, shape or create learners to be anything you want. If you, know, you create the right environment, you could... Um, train someone to be a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, a politician, whatever you name it. Um, it's more focused on the environmental supports. In a way, it's a more optimistic theory. In a way, it's a pessimistic theory because you need the, and the supports in the environment to make it happen. Now, B.F. Skinner was in Bloomington for a while and his daughter in the Skinner box was in Bloomington. One, not the daughter I worked with, the younger daughter was born in Bloomington and um, was raised in the Skinner box here before he went off to Harvard. Said that human beings were constrained by their genetic uh, inheritance. And Watson was saying that this is baloney, that human beings were shaped solely by their environment. Over the years, Watson studies the behavior of babies, hundreds of them. To Watson, we arrive in the world of blank slate, tabula rasa. Nearly everything is learned. Even things we think are instinctual, like fear. To prove that environment is more powerful than genetics, Watson designs an experiment for an infant known as Little Albert. He's so confident, he films it for posterity. At first, Albert shows little fear, even when Watson places a burning newspaper in front of him. Albert is also unafraid when he encounters a white rat for the first time in his life. 
But then, Watson shows Albert the rat accompanied by a loud clanging noise. One of the few things that upsets little Albert. And he does it again. And does it again. Eventually, Albert learns to fear not just the rat, but all furry things, even without the loud noise. In Watson's mind, the little Albert experiment is a success because it proves that fears are learned, not inherited. Watson calls his theory behaviorism and begins to popularize it. He urges parents to take active control of their children's upbringing by shaping their environment. To think of the home as a scientific laboratory. And so he sold many parent guides, um, not surprisingly. Uh, has anyone seen that video in the past or something like it? If you get the Chronicle of Higher Education in the past five or 10 years, there are a few articles written about the controversial nature of that research that we just saw. Now we move on to um, B.F. Skinner, who moves us away from stimulus response psychology to response stimulus. And I'll explain that when I give the short lecture after this. And here we have trying to create a chain of behaviors, trying to teach behaviors by having approximations to what you want to have happen and having those approximations being reinforced. And so you'll see the rat moving towards the cage or away from a cage and as they move towards it, as they touch it, you get some reinforcement from um, that situation or scenario. Let me move on. So you're pressing a lever, if you press the lever, you get reinforced. As you move closer to lever, you get reinforced and so forth and so on. And you have to pull on different, perform different operations in sequence and so forth. Let me go to the next one. And let's see if I can do this. Can you see that, Christian? Yes, sir. Okay. So as you see the mouse moving towards the cage, the light might um, turn on, a pellet comes out. As they approach the lever, then a pellet might come out. So increasingly, as you the behavior gets more and more mm, refined into what you want to have happen, it's not just moving towards it, but actually touching something. And then you have the reinforcement coming up within the system. And so for more precise, and so you actually have to pull on the bar, shifting the lever. Each time you're, it's a more intricate, uh, complex uh, set of behaviors that you're trying to teach. Here are you touching the light, here comes the pellet and so forth. And so you think about human beings this way, this way and then um, you start thinking about how we can program human beings to do what's being done in this particular video sequence. until you eat all that food up and so forth. Let me go to the, the second last one. This is the last one on B.F. Skinner here. Some scientists engineer shiny new consumer goods for an eager public. Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner seeks nothing less than the engineering of human nature. And former Indiana University professor B.F. Skinner from our psychology department prior to Harvard, after Minnesota, he was here. In experiments with subjects as simple as pigeons, Skinner declares that with the right social engineering, we can create a new breed of human being. Skinner is firmly in the behaviorist tradition pioneered by John Watson in the 1920s. Like Watson, Skinner contends that with the right tools, we can predict and control behavior. Skinner really inherited uh, the, the mantle from Watson of behaviorism in this country. But it's kind of interesting to think about how there's a subtle difference uh, in the way they went about it. Watson, as we know, ended up becoming an advertising executive, ended up embracing the American value system as it existed. Skinner was different. Skinner was a visionary. Skinner felt that through behaviorism, he could influence the world 
towards a greater humanity, not meet humanity where it was, but take humanity to a new place through the principles of behaviorism. Picking up where Watson left off, Skinner wants to do the rigorous science to prove that environment is everything. Change the environment, he argues, and you can change the individual. Or in Skinner's case, the pigeon. Skinner himself was a born gadgeteer. Uh, he had, in his own early years, uh, as a boy, for example, he developed ways of sorting ripe, I think it was cranberries, from unripe cranberries. He invented a cannon that would shoot things over his neighbor's fence. This was the kind of man he was. He was developing new ways to do everyday things in ways that were more comfortable, more efficient. During World War II, Skinner had developed a pigeon guidance device for the U.S. military. While the Russians had dogs carrying bombs, and the Swedes had seals to blow up mines, Skinner had a plan of his own. Teaching pigeons to guide missiles to an enemy target. At the time, however, the military had no missiles to guide. But Skinner's pigeon research did not go to waste. He develops a system called operant conditioning to prove that a behavior will be repeated by a subject when rewarded. Repetition leads to reinforcement. Reinforcement to changes in behavior. This hungry pigeon is moving about more or less at random. Sometimes it turns its head to the left. When it does, we reinforce that movement by giving the pigeon access to a dish of grain. Skinner then waits for it to turn further. Again, more food. So there's a story oh. about students in a college classroom who smiled approvingly at their instructor every time he moved closer to the door. And they got, as the story goes, they got him to teach from the hallway. So this can work on humans too. But late, the pigeon will turn in a complete circle having learned that only when he turns will he be rewarded. What Skinner was able to do in very carefully controlled studies with animal models was they demonstrate that whole chains of behaviors could be built step by step so that literally you could teach a pigeon to do complicated behaviors that no one would have predicted possible. And Skinner believes that if it works for pigeons, why not people? In Skinner's and so mind, came the famous teaching machines. And after that, computer-assisted instruction, which I did my master's on. So Skinner led the computer revolution for education. In the early days is all positive reinforcement. Here you see these kids in these crank-out sheets. I don't know exactly what they were doing. Probably math, facts, or vocabulary, or something of that nature. Behavior is behavior up and down the evolutionary scale, and it is all learned. One of the great successes is in education. People are taught to do more complicated tasks than anyone had thought possible by breaking down behavior into small steps and giving positive reinforcement along the way. The essence of Skinner's work was that we could manipulate the environment in ways that would permit us to produce any kind of behavior that we wished, and we could develop individuals in ways that made every possible future um, open to them. The idea that anything is possible. Okay. We got one last one left. Comments. We moved to Zimbardo, and this comes from a clip in teaching introductory psychology, and I and he also has some on statistics. I used to use my statistics or my intro to research class, but this clip here fits really well, and it's a little longer than some of the other ones. It's very very slick and well done. There's a bigger budget, like um like public broadcasting systems might have paid for this, or some foundation uh, probably paid for this video. So. 
Um, let's take a look at what he has to say about behavioral psychology, and then I'll field some questions, and then I'll do a 10 minute or so overview of the behavioral psychology. Behavioral psychologists have come up with new views, not only of animal behavior, oh, but of human nature. And if you as heard well. of the old prisoner experiment at Stanford where they had graduate students pretend to be prison guards and another group pretend to be in the prison and had the, the study was actually a true story where the prison guards pretty abused the, those in the prison. There were classmates of theirs. He was the one conducting that study. So it's he's been around. They, um, Simbardo's his last name. Is it David Simbardo? A uh, Christian can look that up. Look up Simbardo. I, it might be a different first name, but I think it's David. Well, and these views all concern a process that we take for granted, learning, because we are all truly born to learn. Ironically, one of the most important figures in the study of learning, Ivan Pavlov, wasn't concerned with the subject at all, at least not at first. Pavlov, a noted Russian scientist, won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1904. As this original footage shows, Pavlov was initially interested in digestion and the action of the salivary glands. By diverting the saliva of dogs into test tubes, he could precisely measure if and how much they salivated during digestion. When food was presented, the dog salivated quickly and inherited salivary reflex. But over repeated testings, a strange thing happened. The dog salivated before contact with the food. Just the sight of the food was enough to stimulate their drooling. Then, just seeing the food dish, or even hearing the footsteps of Pavlov or his assistants, was enough to trigger this built-in reflex. What was going on to elicit this response? Pavlov decided to find out by systematically varying the stimuli and measuring the dog's reaction. Metronomes, lights, and bells were all used as stimuli, and they all worked as stand-ins for the food. What mattered was not the kind of stimulus that was used, but the fact that it reliably signaled that food was on the way. Pavlov had discovered a fundamental type of learning called classical conditioning. An original stimulus elicits an automatic, unlearned response. Both stimulus and response happen naturally. They are unconditioned. Then a second, neutral stimulus that never elicits the unconditioned response by itself is introduced just before the presentation of the original stimulus. If the neutral or signaling stimulus is presented alone, and a response occurs as if the original stimulus were still there, we say that conditioning has taken place. The arbitrary neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. The reverse is also true. Pavlov and others studied the extinction over time of such conditioned responses. When the subject learns that the conditioned stimulus no longer signals a desired event, the acquisition process is reversed as the learned connection is gradually weakened. Pavlov's work and the work of those who followed him led to a remarkable conclusion. And that is, any stimulus an organism can perceive is capable of eliciting any reaction the organism is capable of making. This means that virtually any sound, sight, or smell can influence the way our muscles tense or relax, our moods fluctuate, or even the way our attitudes are formed. For instance, if I say, relax, and then do this, you're going to be startled and upset. After five or six pairings of relax, just saying the word relax is going to generate a negative response rather than its usual learned reaction. Now, I wonder what the students at Stanford thought when they were um, when they heard the gunfire on the Stanford campus, you know, I mean, today, I don't think you could 
shoot a gun on a camp campus anymore and you know he'd be in jail but so that was probably a 20 year old video or 25 maybe might be close to 30 now yeah that was in the 90s when that that series came out so interesting so i, I think those six or so videos or seven were they kind of summarize a lot of the terms and concepts that we were reading or related to behavioral theory i mean it just they you know video often does a better job than verbalizing what the concepts mean. I could verbalize these things 10 times and explain uh, 10 weeks in a row and you still wouldn't get the effect of watching a one video clip of a dog salivating, you know, and actually seeing something like that happen. Um, comments on, on any of those videos? I mean, I think that when this is all coming from whether we were talking about like the eugenics movement before that, or like with the um, with the behaviorist movement, I feel like they're both kind of based on observing animals and and being like, well, we here's how we can tinker with animal behavior and genes, right, to, to change the outcomes. And I guess something that's maybe missing from that is just like the human agency that comes into play when we're talking about applying that same reasoning to humans. But I mean, clearly it's effective because like, you know. Most people are addicted to their phones <laughs> and it seems like, you know, smartphones are probably the some, the pinnacle of application of behavior theory, you know, with notifications and, you know, all kinds of like instant, you know, rewards and stuff, just picking up your phone and scrolling on Instagram or things like that. Exactly. Um, and, and by the way, um, Christian, thanks for the link on Zimbardo. It's Philip Zimbardo and he's 90 years old now or about. And there's an explanation at the Wikipedia site on the Stanford prisoner experiment. If, if you haven't heard of that prison study, um, you know, it, it's worth it's worth reading about anyhow. Um, interesting guy, interesting guy. Other, qu any questions on behavioral theory for me before I do a rapid run through of the slides that you can watch the video of. So I, I don't need to do the lecture again. I'm just, again, going to, Hit, hit the highlights. Comments or questions on behavioral theory? Or where, how, let me ask this, where do you, have you seen behavioral theory instantiated in your own environments, whether it's professional or personal? Um, during the breakout rooms earlier, I had to give my dog uh, dog treats. And now she's reinforced when I'm in an important Zoom call, the worse her behavior is, the better a chance she gets a dog treat <laughs> so <laughs> I mean I couldn't you know I had that little breakout session but then um so then I got to think thinking and I know you're going through the slides but in what's the difference between negative reinforcement and positive punishment yeah so negative reinforcement is really a, a positive thing um so I, I'll have them in the slides yeah. okay I'll wait we'll wait for it. My dog did not like the bell in that last video either. Oh, no. I don't know if she's been conditioned for something there. And I see Nader's got a cat in the background that might have been affected too. Yep, she is. You okay? Yeah. Um, so when you were looking at the little Albert video, I would think something that happens back home in our culture, right? Um, when the kid misbehaves, if you misbehave, I'm going to take you to the doctor and you're going to get a shot. You know? And then the kid associates the pain with misbehaving. And whenever it's really time to go to the doctor, the kid will throw a huge tantrum and a hissy fit, not wanting to go to the doctor. Yeah. It's because this is what he learned. He associates doctor with shots and pain. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So the same with dentists. You know, you associate yes. this is this is called classical uh, contingence. Conting, I can't even pronounce it. It's the first of the three, I'll go through classical condition, operating condition, and then con contingency. I, I'm not pronouncing it right, but that's that's what's happening there. Um, and so are you from um, the Middle East or in what country? Lebanon, yes, Lebanon, Middle East, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So in your culture, parents threaten to take the kids to get a shot if they misbehave. That's what used to happen when we were kids, right? Yeah, I don't that, think that happens with us. I don't, you know, does anyone- That and the mommy slipper back in the day, but not anymore. Yeah, mommy slipper hitting him on the head or on the hands? No, on the butt. Oh, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> even, 
Yeah, in the U.S. culture, and when I was growing, up, it was a belt, of course, and um, didn't feel we, good. We had the slipper or the bamboo cane, and trust me, you would not want to try the bamboo cane. Yeah, I was gonna say I had to go out and pick a switch from outside. <laughs> you had to pick which switch was gonna they were gonna hit you with. Mm -hmm. How many switches were? optional how many how many did they have? i don't know yeah we I, they, we usually had like some real green like there would be like those long green rods or whatever like going out of the ground so yeah if, you know if they're more ripe there's uh it's they it's, hurt it's, they it's, hurt more the more ripe they are Ooh. yeah whereas if they are older and, and kind of faded they don't hurt as much yeah there's i guess maybe less flexibility to it as it's swinging <laughs> right and uh, and the pieces, if they're old, they could be falling apart and all that. So, you know, when, yeah. yeah. Christian, did you get one of those switches? A belt and a wooden spoon. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> a mixing mixing spoon. It was multi multi-purpose. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I remember Sister Jan hitting my hands with a ruler in, in elementary school. Um, sure. Um, a lot of this is outlawed now, right? The, well, the way <laughs> some of us are raised is outlawed, and it may vary by country um, and so forth. Well, let me do a quick. So, go ahead. There, there was a librarian in seventh grade. Um, he's since passed, but um, when classes would come to do like instruction about how to use the library, he would be up talking about it. He would always have a yardstick with him, and he had this yardstick about this big um so maybe like the size of a uh, baseball um of masking tape around the one end and it kind of was tapered and so people would fall asleep during his lectures so he would come by and smack the desk with the baseball size masking tape yardstick <laughs> right next to their head <laughs> he wouldn't hit him yeah <laughs> but, yeah I, yeah I i understand that concept um <laughs> nobody was okay. falling asleep after that <laughs> no not a, not a one holding their eyes like this you know <laughs> toothpicks <laughs> yeah holding up the toothpicks okay so christian it's it's um 9 18 on my watch so 9 28 at 9 27 tell me i have a minute left okay so we'll do a 10 minute run through of what main things about behavior there you again the video is there it hasn't changed all that much it might have changed a little but it hasn't changed much and so now we take a look at you know behavioral psychology which involves a number of players and the father of psychology William Wundt was initially looking at consciousness and introspection uh, on our volitions our passions our emotions with other people in in uh, whether well, psychologists in Germany that was the founding of the the Psych field of psychology in his laboratory. But as we move into behavioral theory, we start um, nixing or not thinking about what happens introspectively inside. And we start looking at the, the environment that, that shapes us from a blank slate to be able to operate in our living and working and breathing environments out there. One of the first people out there in, in the field of psychology was Ebbinghaus, which looked at how we, he looked at um, how we remember, how we learn and how much we forget, which gets us into kind of psychology, actually. He's not a behaviorist per se, but he learned learning through repetition, which all behaviorists really believe in, trying to repeat lists over and over to himself and look at whether we can recall them in serial order or um, having primers and so forth. Um, having starter terms to 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 enable us to recall, and I, I did a study 30 years ago of similar to this. Actually, my first published study was looking at memory repeated readings for passages. If anyone was interested in reading it, we had scrambled story, make a story, and canonical, straightforward stories with undergraduate students. So I've got a memory study. It's not my area. I have had several actually. Um, so he had people recall things in order, free recall, um, and and serial recall recalling the list in the order, free recall in any order. So Ebbinghaus was a big player early on. Thorndike was another big player looking at what was called associational learning, looking at how an organism mm, mm, moves within their environment the, mm, and how one is rewarded within their environment called the law of effect. And the more you're rewarded, the higher chances or probabilities that you'll engage in that behavior again. Another guy at Wisconsin in those days was a guy named Clark Hall who tried to mathematize learning and had mathematical equations for all the types of learning that was occurring to predict whether learning would 
behaviors would be repeated over time. Um, so Thorndike was kind of interested in actions and the environment, both. Whereas Skinner and uh, Watts are more interested in the, envir in the environment themselves itself and trying to shape that environment. Um, Thorndike, I had a, a, a activity, a video showing cats and dogs manipulate um, a cage that Thorndike had built to look at whether or not cats can be intelligent enough to get through a puzzle box or something like that, to get through the levers and so forth. And so, in effect, he was kind of a behaviorist and cognitivist, both in some ways, shape or form. And I can't, I don't have time to go through everything there, but behaviorist, again, Think about learning and, and human beings as being a blank slate that all learning is starts, all that we know starts um, with conditioning that we happens within our environments per se. Pavlov was known for classical conditioning. We've seen this before. We pair up, a, you know, we have food that emits salivation um, and an unconditioned response. And if we have a tuning fork or a bell or footsteps or a mellotron or you know, if you a food dish or just something gets paired up often enough that we'll just start salivating when we just see that we don't need to get reinforced, actually. And so they call that a, a, a conditioned stimulus, if you will. Um, a little joke, Pavlov, that name rings a bell. So we have classical conditioning, which is Pavlovian conditioning, operant conditioning is Skinnerian conditioning and contiguity, which is that, you know, going to get a shot when you misbehave or going to the dentist and getting your dr teeth drilled, if you do it over a series of times or states that that, that will in, um, emit um, or invoke a particular type of psychophysiological response in terms of how one reacts to the environment, um, gets nervous, gets petrified when they see um, a needle or um, how much time we have left, Christian, five minutes? Um, yep. Yep. Okay. So that's continuity. We've got, um, you know, basic SR patterns that happen when we hear the word Beethoven, we have a certain response automatically. We hear um, Katrina, um, Harvey, or I uh, Ian. Yeah, that was the one in Florida this year. We have a, you know, something immediately that we call, we have a something that happens psychophysiologically within us um, when we have certain terms that come up like July 4th or 1776 or Afghanistan or whatever. Um, let's go on to, and it, that kind of explains why people freak out when they see a needle, why they get stomach pains and so forth. Um, so the initial definitions that Jennifer mentioned earlier was an unconditioned stimulus, a stimulus that produces an unlearned response. Um, and then we have the conditioned stimulus, conditioned responses, unconditioned, and so forth. Those were all in the videos that we watched. Something that's initially neutral and does not produce a particular response, like seeing a white rabbit, seeing a rat, uh, or you know, see, seeing uh, or a, a light goes on initially doesn't produce something, but it gets paired up enough times um, with the food to elicit the response. We don't, no longer need the food; we just have to turn on the light or um, hear a certain sound or or whatever in that environment to evoke that behavior that's going to happen. Some things are primary in terms of reinforcers, water and food and so forth, and some things are secondary, like grades and points and praise and smells and tastes and so forth. And so we have our primary re reinforcers getting sleep. We have our secondary or conditioned reinforcers like a gold star, like I got in first grade reading so many, was it first grade or second second grade reading so many books and getting my gold stars that I wanted to get. Um, and then we can also, you know, focus on not just lower order skills, but we can get some higher order conditioning that, that might happen as well. Uh, Jennifer in our group talked about extinction, spontaneous recovery and discrimination. We don't have time to go through all those. You can read the definitions if you watch the videos to be able to discriminate between different kinds of stimuli and different behaviors that we might want to happen to be able to extinguish certain things over time. I'm gonna, I need to move on. Um, we got, well, got three minutes left, Christian. Three minutes, yeah. Yeah, so Watson was one of the first ones in the behavioral camp, and he later moved on to marketing, as the video pointed out, whereas Skinner just stayed with it and wanted to help humanity over time. Watson was out to make a buck. He also did some unethical things with his graduate student and other people, and so he had to he actually burned all his records near the end of his career um, and so forth. His granddaughter is a famous actress. You can look this up, Marianne Hartley. Um, 
who, yeah, she's in Wikipedia. So Watson was a, you know, um, was a very successful guy until he ran into some difficulties, like what happens to many people. Other people in the reaction to behaviors look at introspection, looking inside, looking at kind of, that's a picture of me about 20, uh, 20, 25 years ago, 22 years ago in Hawaii doing introspection. Watson didn't believe in introspection. He says, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and I'll guarantee to bring them up as a doctor, a lawyer, an artist, whatever vocation that you want. Um, I can I can do it through my theory. I can get them to um, to have certain you know, traits and abilities and competencies over time. Um, and so Skinner followed in Watson's lead, but instead of looking at stimulus response theory, he'd look at the responses. At, um, he had what was called response stimulus theory. Um, now, he believed that things happen within the skin, in your head, but they're just not reliable to measure. So behaviors are objectivists. They, 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 they want to see things clearly in front of them. They're not subjective in any way. They want to look at the overt behavior. And so that's Skinner with, as you saw in the video, and um, IU faculty, 1945 to 48, and different um, bills and different terms again. Um, satisfying behaviors mean reinforcing occur reinforcing the behavior is more likely to occur in the future. Unsatisfying means the behavior is less likely to occur. You had you've been punished for it, and we want to all get to that punishment list. So I better move forward since I'm out of time already here. Um, so we want to increase the frequency of the behaviors that we want uh, and decrease those that we don't want. And so we at this table, we give something pleasant, it's positive reinforcement. Uh, we take something away that's adversive that they don't want, like the parking stick uh, ticket, that's negative reinforcement. Yeah, 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 thanks. Uh, whereas we give someone the paddle on the butt or the hands or wherever, that's punishment. Whereas um, we uh, we... Reinforcement removal, taking away something that's uh, pleasant. We're taking a, well, I'm not sure what the examples of that is because that's the hard one. Again, that's the parking thing. Driver must pay a stiff fine for in parking in a restricted area. Uh, again, I don't understand that one. I'll just fully admit. <laughs> I've been teaching this one for 34 years and I still don't understand reinforcement removal. So we'll just, we won't, you won't be tested on it. I've never had it come up in society ever. I don't know what it is, I'll fully admit. So we'll look at the other three and be happy with that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I probably could figure it out if I had five minutes. So we have fixed and variable forms, schedules of reinforcement, some things that are every, on a, every two weeks or at a fixed interval of time or at a variable interval of time or at a fixed ratio in terms of number of cranks and so forth. I like this quote best to end with for Skinner. I did not direct my life. It didn't, I didn't design it. Things just came up and that's what, what happened. Every faculty member will agree with this one. Things come up every day. People, we got to write letters of rec for, we got to get things approved. We got courses get approved. We got this, we got to do that. We're all pigeons in you know, we're all faculty are a bunch of pigeons that fill out forms forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, I don't really recommend becoming a faculty member. We're just, we're just, you want to be a pigeon? No, I'm just kidding. It's a great job. <laughs> you got to remember, I, I, I'm kidding half the time. This is Julie Vargas Skinner's uh, first daughter who I worked with. Uh, she had the office next to me at West Virginia for three years. Skinner said, education is what survived when it has been learned is forgotten. And he'd be the world's oldest living human being, I think, if he was still alive at 118 or 117. He'd be turning 118 next month. Um, the real question is not whether machines think, but whether men do or humans do. Um, and then he had the problems of punishment. He had issues about um, learned helplessness. Oh, this is important. If you use the same form of feedback over and over and over again, your learners will get satiated on it. They, you know, if you always say, you know, that's great. Well, if you say that's great, they, they don't they're not able to distinguish good from inferior performance. So you use a variety of mm, ways to uh, praise mm, or verbalizations. That's fabulous. That's wonderful. I never thought about that before. You've extended well beyond the assignment I ever thought was possible. Uh, you created something totally new. Don't just say that was really great today. That was nice. They'll satiate on that. So, you know, so vary the, and then granny's rule is real important. 
eat all your peas and carrots and you can go out and play, or you can eat all your peas and carrots and you can have pudding. So this is another thing that like the phrase principles alive and well, granny's rules alive and well all over the place in education. This is a, over and over and over again. If you do your homework, I'll let you play with the pet penguin or you know hamster or whatever it is, right? That's granny's rule. Um, and you have the humanist Carl Rogers versus the behaviorist B.F. Skinner. It's really a Rogerian Skinnerian. Rogers, the humanist, Skinner, the behaviorist. That's why I am a Rogerian Skinnerian. I believe in both. I more believe in Carl Rogers and get, if you want to get a good book, his books, Freedom to Learn, will really, really are applicable today. He used to be a Wisconsin professor, I believe, for a short period of time. He was a clinical psychologist and therapist in Chicago area for a long time, I believe. He died while falling down the stairs after visiting Russia. So there's a little suspect things going on there, um, what might have happened, given all the things we heard about Russia today. But anyways, I don't think it was something. Well, who knows? Um, so reinforcers increase the likelihood of responding. Terminate, negative reinforcement, the termination of an adverse stimulus. So if you take something like the parking ticket away, or a quiz, we'll take away, if you do well on all the other, we'll take away the final quiz, you know, negative reinforcement, right? Um, so yeah, we won't make you run the laps in high school basketball if you make your, you know, your free throw, more than 80% of your free throws. And then another important word is shaping, approximations, like the rat we saw in the video, gradually moving towards the behavior that you want to see happen, shaping as Skinner did over and over, clicking the bell and you're moving toward more, and then chaining those behaviors together, where you learn to dance the tango. I have a current study looking at tango dance instructors, believe it or not, our field, we can do anything. So we're looking at how they self-directed their learning during the pandemic. Um, then fading the prompts. My dissertation involved prompting students to think critically about their writing creatively, and then we faded the prompts out over time. So showing them, um, providing them, providing the gentle nudges, providing the instruction, scaffolding the instruction, and then taking away, weaning it away over time, fading it out over time, and letting the student assume more control over the environment. That today is really the effective instruction, really guided, guided learning or guided discovery learning, some might say. And then timeout, putting someone in a timeout room if they're misbehaving. That's another technique that's used quite a bit, especially by school psychologists for kids that might be totally off task quite a bit. And then they form these schedules of, you know, being in timeout rooms and looking at the, how the behavior is changing over time. Skinner says he's not a hypocrite. He controlled his own behavior when he was doing well. We got a paper published that day. He let himself play the piano. He loved to play the piano, but only if he did something that deserve playing. If you watch the movie on Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers played piano when he did something, you know, he had a day when he, you know, felt like he accomplished a lot. He structured his writing room, which um, I'll, I talk about a lot in my 795 class, structure your, your writing space to be more productive. He focused on observable behavior, prerequisite skills, presenting instruction if um, materials effectively. Uh, that's, this is, this is the what Christian's group, the breakout group, you guys are focused on, the implications for schools and classrooms to provide those gentle nudges, the prompts, the scaffolds, the hints, to provide the positive feedback and the reinforcers, to provide the, the sequencing of the instruction and the agenda and all this stuff and the in a simple to complex sequencing of performance and to look at how people are trying it out. Uh, like Gagne said last week, the observable behaviors, and then reinforcing that and, and ameliorating the incorrect behaviors. Um, and then you can get at informational feedback and so forth and problems of, oh, if Bo is still with us, I could say behaviorism has been often mis, uh, much maligned, just like the Chicago Bears who can't play football or never get a quarterback who can't play football. Sorry, Bo, I had to throw that one in there. Um, so that's it. That's a more than 10 minutes, a 15 minute run through. Um, anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, I, you know, that you can see there's a lot of terms. There's a lot of important things that happen with behavioral psychology. Uh, it's difficult to understand all the terminology that psychologists like to throw out there because to become known, you have to often develop a discipline or a set of terms to become distinguished from someone else. So they, everyone likes to create their own set of terminology. Uh, did that help in giving a quick overview of behavioral? theory with the videos, discussion, 
end the lecture. And you can go back to the video, it's recorded. I'm a lot younger in that video, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and uh, you can see the 15 year younger me um, who slickly controlled. I had nobody filming me. I was controlling that through the system that IU developed. And um, I think given the system, we had high dev systems in the school of ed. It turned out pretty good. I, consider, I had someone afterwards take the videos and snip a little bit. Um, but even though, no, I, no, no, I, when I didn't. So I really had to do that all myself. Um, so hope you can use the eight pack of learning theory videos. Uh, and I hope you have a good blog postings this week. And you have an assignment due in a week with an extension to next week, Saturday. So a week from Saturday. Questions or comments before we go? Oh, what about the one that you said is a team assignment, the video? Are we in the blog teams doing it or what? No. Wait, wait, wait. Repeat that. There's an assignment that you said is a team one, the video of the trend. You said in the same team. Yeah, that's, I do remember that. It says in the same teams, you'll do, you'll do this. So what's that? Delete anything that says teams. <laughs> Don't read it. Don't read it. It's a okay. typo. If it, someone asked me that in my in the class last week and they found a page in here where it says teams, I think that's left from a previous semester and it should be wiped out. Okay. okay. I apologize. Yeah. So anything that says teams are optional in here. All teams are optional. I mean, is it encouraged and other faculty require it in my classes, they're optional. Yeah. It's a, it's a misprint. I, I missed that one. Yeah. So it's page six, I think, of the syllabus. Um, someone raised it last week, or they might have raised it by other, maybe I made the same mistake in both classes. So, but yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, anything else? Christian, thanks for your help tonight. And next week, Meng Wan Zhao and I will be here with you. And um, the following week on, on Monday, February 20th, we'll have two people who are doing instructional design, both graduate are Turkish former students, my advisees, both um, finished about three or four years ago. Both are um, you know, doing wonderful things. And I'll be coming to you from Florida. I'll be down there for a few days. So I'll, I'll be um, um, at night coming, coming to you from wherever I am down there for a few days. My brother just retired to Florida. So I'm gonna, gonna go see him. I, I haven't seen him since the pandemic. So um, since the, I haven't seen any of my family since, except for my kids since the pandemics. Um, so I will stop the recording here and um, stop. And week five, part two, 